I very shortly want to present everybody who is here. My name is Hermann Patzinger. I'm president of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Strange title, but there are the national museums, national muse libraries and national archives in Berlin, including huge archaeological uh, collections on the museum island. And by chance, I'm also an archaeologist by myself. Then Jonathan Tapp, I just presented, you heard him. Then there is Corinne Wegner, Cultural Heritage Preservation Officer from the Smithsonian Institution, well-reputed institution, training US military and very experienced in cultural emergency projects. I think, I'm sure they had a lot of interesting things to say. Then Stefano De Caro, Director General of ICROM, classical archaeologist, before that general director of the Antiquity Service of Italy, and be careful with him, he is a very uh, successful negotiator in returning illicit things we, which arrived abroad. And last not least, Andreas Gergen, director general of culture in the German Foreign Office, and different positions he hold before this one. He is very experienced also with different kind of, of culture, um, and I think he, it's very good that he is also here with us. I mean, we have not much time, but I think what, what we want to do is a little bit also to, to, to learn some lessons. And perhaps for the discussion, we have to go on. We have just a few points, introductory point, perhaps around this, the discussion, of course, around other points, the discussion can turn. I wrote down a few points which I think are important in that. I mean, most important is really, and this has nothing to do with destructions, illegal traffic of antiquities, is the object care presentation and research together. I think, first of all, there should be uh, uh, an agreement between all of us. We have these collections in the West, for example, but we should consider it as, a, it as in a kind of shared heritage. And we have a common responsibility, and for this reason, we also have a responsibility to know what's happening there. But even if these uh, cultures are in crisis, as the title of this workshop, as it's even better uh, heritage in danger or heritage at risk, but uh, of course, we also have to include them in our working with this heritage. I mean, fighting illicit traffic of antiquities was the most important point. It was touched in several of the presentations. I mean, the German law, uh, it was mentioned also, is a shame. We are working hard on that uh, to make it n not anymore so soft, to make it harder with a clear uh, proof of provenance, uh, object ID, where does it come from, has it illegally been exported, all this has to be necessary. I'm very curious how many pieces then will remain in the antiquity market. But I'm very optimistic that we will, perhaps latest in the coming year, we will have a reasonable law in this sense in Germany. Of course, this will not solve all the questions, all the problems, but at least this is what we can do, and many other European countries are in the same way. I mean, we have this illicit project. It was in one lecture, it was said that uh, we don't know the structure of this illegal trafficking and so on. And as Martin, uh, Markus Hilger in his lecture said, or shortly mentioned, we have now started a project to learn about this. How is it organized? How are the networks working? I think this is very important then to work preventionally. The red lists from ICOM are extremely important. I mean, they are helping authorities, police, customs authority to recognize pieces at the border when they are really, they should be stopped. For example, when we had a conference for the same reason in December in Berlin, there was Abdul Karim who gave this video message and he said it's a large problem that Turkey, I, I will say it in not very diplomatic way, is not cooperating. So the border, if there are countries like Iraq and Syria, which are an extreme situation, the border have to work, have to function. So there needs a, a close cooperation between Syria and Turkey, which it seems for the time being it's not existing. About capacity building, you said that. We have similar programs now. I mean, when they ask us, they say, send us please acid-free packing material for, ta for cuneiform tablets, for example. Seems ridiculous, but for the moment, it's very important for them training people for special issues. I think there we really should perhaps act more in an international way, coordinated way. Now we are doing this within Germany, but I think we should do it in an international way. And the awareness raising. What I always thought during these lectures is really education, education, education. Education, the people in our countries, when you are as a tourist, you should not acquire such a piece, even a local man is offering to you. And we should really make people aware, collectors, what they are really, what the hell they are doing when they are buying these objects and uh, if they are not legal. 
And of course, it's also in these countries. This starts with the school books. People must know, and we have examples in Iraq, for example, that tribes who are controlling areas are taking care for the monuments. This has to go on. This is extremely important. And it needs a political agenda. We cannot say more about this, but this plundering and destruction have reasons. We have to care also to deal with the reasonings. Reasoning is Islamism, but it's also a question of what is the, the living condition of the people? Why do they get radical in all these questions, etc., etc.? And there are interesting NGOs, Heritage for Peace, for example. Can't we support them better? Can't we help them better in doing their work, which we are not allowed to do, which we are afraid to do? And many other things which should be discussed. In the beginning, there was this blue helmet idea uh, for culture. Yet, but how? How can they help? I think for IS country or dominated regions, it's already too late, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there's a lot to discuss, but I think we should really get to some points to go forward. I mean, perhaps I want to ask you first, Corinne, to, what is your experience? I mean, you, you are perhaps the most experienced of us in these cultural emergency projects. Well, I have to say, um, my experience was limited until 2003, and as part of the US military force as a reservist, I ended up going to Baghdad and um, as a uh, curator and trying to help in any way I could to, to stabilize that collection and help the staff. And there are several people in the room that I worked with closely there from the British Museum and other places. But I, I was very surprised to learn at that time that there wasn't really a, a task force of people who come parachuting in to help in, in an emergency response. I'm not talking about capacity building or long range recovery projects. I'm talking about my objects are broken on the floor now. Who is gonna come and help me with that? And unfortunately, we just didn't have a lot of capacity. And then much later, I was um, working uh, in this area of disaster recovery when the Haiti earthquake happened. And I learned that the Smithsonian actually had a lot of capacity to try and and deal with that. So I think one of the messages that, that I'd like to say and that we've learned in working with partners like, excuse me, like ICOM and ECROM and ICOMOS is this idea that in the cultural heritage community, my, my colleague Helen, who spoke about Bosnia, said we have to mainstream our thinking to make cultural heritage part of the humanitarian response. We also have to mainstream our thinking and stop constantly reacting and uh, responding. We have to start thinking about resiliency. We, the cultural uh, or the um, emergency planning world has far gone beyond us by 50 years. They're, they're saying response doesn't work. Reacting doesn't work. You have to have a plan in your head before the disaster happens. You have to have money before the disaster happens. And we have to start thinking in that way more and more. Stefano, what are you thinking when you watch at all these presentations as ICROM president? Uh, I was very, uh, it's like if I walk the, around my life, because I came from a country in which there was illegal excavation and illegal exploitation, and uh, I had to fight with the mafia, local mafia, doing illegal excavations. I think it's worse than IS, isn't it? Or? Mm, sometimes they behead the heads in the same way, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, I think that we are improved through involving the community. Because also the mafia has a background in community. And when we started 40 years ago, there was just one museum in Naples that was the Museum of the King. The people of the countryside in Caserta province, they considered heritage something just for tourists for buyers, but not for them. And when we started the excavations, fighting illegal excavators, on the walls they were, there were just scratches, a basso down with the superintendents. And they fired on Jean-Paul Morel, who was the French archeologist that we called for making rescue excavations. 20 years after, we have done, we have done a museum just where uh, Jean-Paul Morel was <laughs> targeted, and a lot 
after a long process of involving school children, and now it's, ru it's run by the community, by the major. They pay for this museum. It's a long, long process. You have to, to convince the community that uh, this is not something for the main cities, for rich people, but this is something of there. And it tends not to be just archaeology, because uh, archaeology needs a kind of education which is not for all the people. Uh, of course, you can have uh, elements in the, f in the primary school, but the, for the most of the people, heritage is uh, the square of their village, is the tree where uh, I very much appreciated the presentation of uh, Rosian Galdruat because there was the idea that also just a watch or just a, a picture of the family is heritage. And for the people to be repatriated, we hope in some years, uh, the Eco Museum, the community museum, this kind of museum of normal things for normal people, is the best innovation in the field of the museum that the Western world has de have developed. Because uh, this makes the idea of the presentation, of the, pre of the interpretation, of the narrative, expands the field from just the top of the heritage, the beautiful Greek vases, the richest silver, to the idea that heritage is for everybody. That every one of us, rich or poor, has an heritage. It's our task to, to share this idea beyond the borders of uh, ethnicity, of uh, race, of uh, beliefs, etc in order that they are touched not so much to what the politicians say, you are Muslim or you are, no. Heritage is the heritage in their territory. They are in their territory, it's like the trees, it's like the mountains. Every one of us is responsible for the maintenance of the environment, and the environment is both natural and cultural. We don't ask to the trees, if you, they are Muslim, of the rocks, if they are Christians or other things. They are beautiful. They are in your territory, you are accustomed to live with them. And so you have to protect. This is a, a, the next step of our museology. I think we all can agree to that. Andreas, of course, we need also somehow a political agenda, how to deal with this problem. I mean, when the baby fell into the water, like in North Iraq and great part of Syria, it's difficult to act. We can only act from outside, and we talked about things which can be done. But when there are approaching crises somewhere in the world, as representative of the German Foreign Office, have you any idea what really, we heard about this in the morning, they have not been with us, this idea from the Italian Deputy Minister of uh, Culture, Blue Helmets or whatever, uh, or other, other politic parts of a political agenda. I think we, we have to think about that too. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's not only a, a, a national question. Now, what's on, on, on stake for, for foreign policy is, firstly, perhaps, that the, the question of identity of, on international level is a question of foreign policy. And as long as culture is part of our culture of diplomacy, um, well, we have, to, we, have to shift our, we have to shift our instruments and our programs towards, towards these new challenges. Um, <clears throat> that's, and, and that's perhaps part of a, a first part of an answer. So really to shift money to public funding for what you call a, a task force or what the German Archaeological Institute stressed, um, stressed today uh, what they are doing in Tunisia or in the Northern Arab countries. That's part of cultural policies abroad in order to protect, in order to protect cultural identity. And, 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 second is, and second is that we are also part of that. We have our shared responsibility. And that's a question related to the work of the museums in Europe. How do you grant access? How do you educate the people in the countries where, you, um, where you, your exponent, um, exponents are coming from. How do you, how do you connect with your, with your museologic 
with, with your work, with their questions they have actually in Egypt or in Northern Africa or in, or in Syria. So we have that responsibility to have a safe harbor. That's great. But we also have to grant access um, for those people for those people who are connected to those to those items of identity. And thirdly, and thirdly, there's still a legal framework. You discussed about the legal framework in, in, in Germany, and we are both happy that the, the Minister of Culture is taking care of that. We have to learn a, a lot from our Italian friends. Um, when, I, when I think about your task force, your Carabinieri task force, well, that's something really that's a role model for Europe. And, and we have to learn some, something from you. Um, second, on a European level, we have that European um, directive for Syria and for Iraq, but we have to do more in order to protect better. And then there is an international level. So even if we all consider that blue helmets might not be might not be the right answer in the right moment or on a practical level would not work. We have to raise the awareness of the international community that those attacks are criminals, are, are war crimes, and that we have a responsibility to deal with that and to look for the prosecutors and, and to make that normativity work. Um, and that's on international level, I think. Yes, it would be great to, to have one of these culture destructor, or how, how to call them, uh, for the, in front of the courts in Hague. Um, I mean, we, we heard about what the museums are doing, the different institutions, and it's indeed, I want to, to, to repeat that, Italy is a model, because your cabinetary unit has about 300 members. In Germany, the federal police uh, department, which is dealing with that, has only three. There may be two more, I but like the, the relations are clear. But um, uh, it was not just Carabinieri. You see, it was a, a combined system. Yeah. Because it was the carabinieri, it was the legal prosecutor, it was the superintendency yeah. that provided expertise, it was uh, the, the, the tribunal, it was a, a joint program. Unfortunately, it is uh, just enforced not by a law, because the carabinieri are depending on the law, but it was also a, a, a happy political moment. Uh, now, I think that only the carabinieri are working, but a lot of negotiation should be re re repeated by instance. One of the tools was the long-term loans to the museums in the United States or elsewhere. And they are not working. And it would be important because one of the offerings in change of the borders, customs, and the major impact was offering material for study, for research, for publications, free of charge, possibility of excavating in Italy. Italy has been, been the director general. It was signing hundreds of uh, authorization for excavating. Not so much because we needed more materials, but because the university from abroad, they needed to have more research. But a research not linked with the existing materials in the storerooms, it's a little bit foolish. We are plenty of materials that can be used for research abroad. We have extended the, the, the terms of the laws for, for 10 years, 20 years, changing uh, the materials after. And this was the effect of the Berliner Erklärung. <laughs> so uh, there is a process, but it needs to be continued on international levels with the, and Europe is a good platform for doing it. This leads me to a question, to a point that this is the role of the museums. Of course, the museums, perhaps there may be one, but, but I mean, normally they do, the, 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 the public museums do not acquire anymore, and they should not, but I think most do not acquire things, archaeological objects, which are in doubt from the, concerning their provenance. And we have this cooperation with you in Berlin. We had really very important pieces for three months, for four months, then they go back. I think this exchange is very important. For the museums, it's not necessary really to acquire things and to push the Ill illegal antiquity market. But anyway, the museums are not really, uh, they, are, they do not play an important role. These are private people. There was recently, uh, perhaps two weeks ago or three, there was a documentary in the German TV in Aspekte 
um, and filming around what's happening in the Syrian Turkish border. And there are people from all over the world ordering, I want a mosaic with human designs, I want a statue as complete as possible, and things like that. And then they take the orders and they go on excavating and, and so Apparently there support. are people and producing fakes. Fakes as well. I love so much. I mean, are, in, in this case, in certain countries, it's easier to excavate illegally than to produce a fake. Um, I mean, what we heard also from you, um, it's clear that all the museums, institutions are doing similar work. But so training programs and so on, sending help, uh, digitizing, heritage documentation. What do you think, Jonathan, what could we do better together? What should be more coordinated and how? I think it would make sense, I mean, if some of these uh, training programs were coordinated so that we're not duplicating efforts, and that requires international cooperation. Uh, in other words, sharing those resources, whether they're teaching resources or field resources, whatever they are, I think that would be a very sensible thing to do. I could just add that I think, um, I, I didn't mention, I'm also the chair of the ICOM Disaster Relief Task Force, and one of the things that ICOM strives to do is when museums are involved in offering some sort of training response, um, that they're able to kind of hear from all the different actors and know who's doing what and are a little bit able to help coordinate our efforts. So for instance, we wanted to, um, Smithsonian uh, wanted to go to Egypt and see if there was anything we could offer <clears throat> for the Museum of Islamic Art. And ICOM said, oh, well, we heard our, our friends from the German Archaeological Institute are also interested in it. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is very interested. So we were able to coordinate that effort, arrive at the same time, because I know one of our problems at the Iraq Museum was, you know, constant loads of people coming through to do yet another assessment without ever actually offering on the ground assistance. And I think that's, that's just totally critical, excuse me, critical, dry throat. Um, and, that, and that's why we're, we're just basically at Smithsonian focused at the moment on small, high impact projects like working with Syrian colleagues who are working in areas that the Syrian government does not control and they're struggling to save their cultural heritage. And we're giving them basic emergency training, buying them equipment and sending them back to do this work. And we're working with the academic community also, University of Pennsylvania is one of our colleagues. So, I, I, so oh, thank you so much. So, you know, by, by working with partners, creating new networks, finding the people who can grant you that access, like, you know, Syrian colleagues who may be outside of Syria now, um, Iraqi colleagues who can help with access on the ground. We're working with the Erbil Institute in Iraq. So, you know, there are a number of ways that I think we can better coordinate our efforts. Uh, one question to you, Corinne. Do you think that there was a change in awareness and consciousness? You worked a lot with the US military, for example, if troops from the West enter a country, realize military actions, if, for example, they have to construct a helicopter landing place, not to do it in the center of Babylon, to do it in another place, has all these terrific happenings around the Near East and around the world, have they led to a certain change in consciousness in concerning our military specialists or not? So. I think that, um, yes, it absolutely has raised awareness, but I'll also say that as um, cultural heritage professionals and as museums, we have a responsibility to train them to recognize and understand cultural heritage when they see it. Um, many countries, 120 some countries, are states parties to the 1954 Hague Convention, which requires you to train your military in the, uh, it, so that they understand what the treaty obligations are under 54 Hague. And so I, I challenge other museums to seek out their military professionals in their country, because often they're willing, perfectly willing, to do this kind of work and understand better about cultural heritage. And specifically, I, you know, I all agree, 54 Hague is not gonna stop transnational terrorist groups from doing this kind of intentional destruction and looting. They're also not paying attention to other international conventions like the Geneva Conventions, et cetera. However, our military forces are bound by it, and so they're basically fighting with one hand tied behind their back. They're fighting these guys who don't care 
while being expected to protect cultural heritage in the fight, and that's a place where we can help them. Perhaps this would also be a point for the future that in our countries that we also has, somehow we have the duty to, to train these people, to educate the military forces when they go there. What do they find? I remember when I was still president of the German Archaeological Institute and German troops went to Afghanistan, we had a program which was not very long lasting, but a program to train, to educate, to at least tell them what they will find there, which cultures and so on, and what they have, they have to care for. And these will be your blue helmets later. A kind of, yes. It's, it's, it's a very different situation, though. I mean, when you in, in Britain, it's similar. No, no, no. We, we've done very similar things. My colleague Sinjin Simpson has worked very closely with the uh, with the military in training people in Afghanistan, for example. And I think it's fair to say they were very receptive to that sort of training program. But I d just to come back to what you were saying about the blue helmets and whatever, I, I think you know you're dealing with a situation where you know these people, no matter how much they respect their local heritage. <laughs> And you, I've, I've worked in Jordan and Syria where people have been desperately keen to protect their cultural heritage. But when these people didn't ask to be invaded, and you know, if you're confronted with armed men with a machine gun or people are going to cut your head off, what are you going to do? That, that's the problem that we're up against. Not people that want to protect their cultural heritage. Many, many people do. I agree with you that education is important, but these are unusual and very extreme circumstances. So before we open the discussion, one last question to Andreas. I mean, could the Security Council of the United Nations do something, even if it's just a very symbolic thing, or is this idea rubbish? I mean, have we to go on on what we are talking about, or, or can it help if there is a certain, because this always has, can have a positive and also a negative effect. Yeah, but, you know, international conventions are perhaps not only made for the perpetrators, um, but also for those who respect the rules. And so in any, way, in any way, it could be very important that the international community reaffirms what she is taking for a legal, or what she wants to be a legal framework. And by reaffirming that, and that's related to the Hague Convention, that's related to all the UNESCO conventions, um, you can introduce some two one or three or two new ideas. Um, so I think, I think we should go for that way, and if that conference concludes or on it paling out that the international community has to take care for that issue, I think that would be very supportive for what we are doing with our, with our diplomacy. Anyway, I think it would be good. I mean, we had this conference in Berlin in December last year in the Foreign Office with support of the German Foreign Office, but we closed the shoulders, as we say, we, we, we built an agreement between the German institutions for legislation and so on. But here we are in a much more in, international circle. Perhaps really, we, we will now, in a few minutes, hear what the, the organizers will think. Um, perhaps the outlines of this day we should put into a paper and which we all stand behind that and pass this forward to UNESCO, I don't know. It's something, I mean, we, we are representing a lot of very important institutions and our voice our voices together is something, I think, and um, I think this would perhaps be a good idea, but this, the organizers will later tell us. But now I want to open, I mean, in five minutes we have to leave the panel, but anyway, I think it's not any more time for discussion, but perhaps you have comments, you have ideas, you have things which have not been mentioned sufficiently. Please, and then sec first and second question, and third, and fourth. Okay, and Colin, of course. With Colin we will, finalize. Uh, good afternoon, panel. I found this very interesting day. Uh, uh, There's really sort of a comment uh, with Stefano. I think uh, congratulations to the Carabinieri. I've done a research on this, and the Carabinieri seem to be the best police in the world in defending cultural uh, aspects, because, of course, Italy has a huge mountain of great cultural artifacts and sites of winning which I've visited. Could the possibility of the future to avoid future crises like this getting out of hand is that the Carabinieri could set up a consultancy to many governments around the world. They could say, this is how we've done it, it works, you try it. And they could, and these other countries, especially in the Middle East, they could take up the tab and then if this happens again, they're ready to go with their own police force, with the Carabinieri's advice, to go in and stop people like ISIS in the future, or similar people like ISIS in the future. It's obviously too late for Nimrud, but uh, just a thought. Understood well. You want to know 
which could be the role of, the car of a corp like the Carabinieri? Yes. yes. Well, you say the main point of force of the Carabinieri was uh, not to care only about the Italian antiquity, but to have a database of everything what happened in the world and to look after all items uh, independently of the Italian interest in this and to develop uh, a training for their forces and for other forces all, all around the world. So in a way, they, are, they specialize themselves. In Italy, they are operating on the base of the presence of a caserno carabinieri in every village. So they have a very sensitive point of, view of uh, information wherever, but in the same time, they are also aware of the international interest of this. And I repeat, there is the support of very good international law experts providing expertise when is the case for uh, uh, prosecution in tribunal or when is the case of diplomacy. And they use all the panoplia of tools. But I think that this is a kind of experience that can, that can be easily uh, the core of a multi-police Interpol. And uh, if there is something like this, I think that uh, uh, UN police, in a way, or a UN AG convention can be based on the experience of the Carabinieri, but also of other countries. There are, there, there are good experiences also uh, uh, in other countries. So next turn is yours, your three. May, you, may I ask you to be short, because we are running really out of time, and perhaps you ask your three questions, then who wants to answer can answer, and Colin ran through the last word. Uh, okay. Um, it seems to me that the panel uh, is, has said many wise things, um, but has not really addressed what I thought we were here for. We've just seen the destruction of a really major archaeological site. It is, it is, it is as though uh, Herculaneum had been blown up. Now, what are we going to do to stop ISIS carrying on with this campaign? And what are we going to do to discourage other militant Islamic groups from carrying out similar barbarities in the future? It is quite clear that there's an elephant in the room here which we're not addressing. And that is, where is ISIS being supported? And the truth of the matter is it's being supported from the Gulf. And we need to put political pressure on the Gulf to stop this going on. And I believe that that could work. I, nothing else can. We clearly can't put troops there. But we can put political pressure on those governments which support this Sunni, appalling Sunni destruction, Sunni-led destruction. I think very important point. Was it you who mentioned that before that day? I think it, someone mentioned it. I think this would be part of a political agenda. Then. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Vlasic. I'm a professor at Georgetown University where I teach law and human rights. Uh, before this, um, I worked as the head of operations of the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative at the World Bank, which is a joint endeavor between the World Bank and the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. But it started my career at the UN War Crimes Tribunal as a prosecutor working on the Milosevic case and the Sremenska genocide case. Uh, my modest suggestion is the fact that I think these discussions are wonderful, but I think it's worth elevating the discussion to kind of a supernatural level, bringing together kind of heads of state, heads of industry, uh, and all the middlemen involved in the trade, the, whether it be the insurance companies, the free ports, the um, transport companies, and others, to see if we can put together some sort of public-private partnership and agreement in terms of best standards in terms of the sale of antiquities from conflict zones to try to reduce the value of the marketplace and thereby reducing the terrorist finance going to groups like ISIS and others. Thank you. Thank you. Then you. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that um, Stefano's comments about the future of museology and the sort of direction it should take, I think is really, really positive. And um, if you compare the conservation of the natural world and the conservation of the cultural world, there's a lot of comparisons in the sense that um, historically you have things like zoos being created where cultures are encased. Um, similar to museums, and the future is, I think, to preserve culture in a living environment, which is really, really important, because that's the only sustainable way. The other comment I wanted to say was um, something I thought of um, from James's talk in comparison to what Stefano was saying. Now, James um, separated really, really clearly between this idea of black and white markets, 
whereas the black is the issue and, and the white market is something which is sort of good. But I actually think that there's a massive, massive gray area and it's the gray market which is the issue because I personally, I'm a book conservator by training and I run a small organization to conserve books in Sikh temples. And the issue we have is of um, manuscripts being sold in small auction houses um, where no provenance is given, no background is given. And this auction houses provide a umbrella for people to trade in, very, very, um, in a very dubious sort of way because it allows someone to remain anonymous. Other thing, um, James also spoke quite positively about the role played by collectors and how collectors should be supported um, if they're legitimate. I would actually argue that the idea of collection of culture, of culture itself is one of the roots of the issues because collectors have indirectly destroyed history by collecting cultural heritage which should have been valued by a community or humanity as a whole. And it's been turned into an object of private enjoyment and stripped ask, of its white... Just one more sentence. Okay. And it's the equivalent of taking like a wild tiger, a wild animal, and saying that you're saving it from poachers by putting it in a zoo. That's not sustainable. And I think the idea of wildlife conservation, like if we apply those lessons to heritage, we've got a lot to learn. That's, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. I think that the gray market you talked about is rather dark gray. It should be. So the last word then Colin ran through, and then, I mean, by courtesy, we have to give a chance to the organizers to say something, and at 5.30, we have to leave. Thank you very much. I don't know, otherwise, IS will come in, and <laughs> I don't know what, but. Uh, my concern is with the continued looting, which is a problem that I think doesn't easily go away, and I certainly congratulate the new German legal initiatives, just as I congratulate the Italian successes in getting looted antiquities back from the Metropolitan Museum, the Getty Museum and others. I think we should name them, though they have reformed somewhat. But I have uh, one comment, uh, and then one question. And the comment is, I believe that as long as uh, museums continue to collect looted antiquities, uh, post-1970, if we can use that as a, a guiding line, as long as they collect them by bequest, not just by purchase, as long as they are willing to admit them into national museums, then the problem will continue. And my question or comment is, why do you think auction prices uh, in antiquities sales in New York, for instance, Christie's, Sotheby's, why are auction prices still increasing? I could give you examples, but I won't because I, I want to uh, conclude my question. But isn't that a pessimistic observation that the actual prices at auction for looted antiquity, or I should say unprovenanced antiquities, sold at Christie's and uh, Sotheby's, for instance, Cycladic sculptures, the actual prices of antiquities continue to increase. And until we find a strategy where they start decreasing, I think we're not getting very far. Thank you. Very correct point, and your observation is right. And there's an enormous, and there's a, there are not only growing prices, there's a growing market. There's a growing necessity, a growing demand. And this is the basic problem. Not from the public museums, but especially from very wealthy people all over the world. And this is the basic problem. I was some time ago, it was in Latin America, I had the chance to see a collection. I was shocked. I was shocked what I saw. I was really shocked. And when I heard about the prices, you can't imagine. And when you, when you hear this, then you believe all these stories, terrifying stories, that the third uh, funding in, in importance, the third one for IES and terroristic groups by the money they get through antiquity traffic, it is really an enormous market. So, but then, thank you to everybody. And I think the organizers should now have the opportunity to say a few words to you. So.